people have shown up on time. We're going to start five minutes later. We're going to rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call, please. Mrs. Edward. Here. Mr. Benson. Here. Mrs. Labuda. Here. Mr. Sorensen. Mr. Steingart. Here. I'm going to make a suggestion on the resolution that on the agenda that we go to the resolutions first. Resolution singular. Okay. Okay, so I'd like to make a motion. You don't need a motion. Okay, then. I'm making a motion about the motion. Okay. I'll, I'll move the resolution. Thank Let's you. Not all right. We have some discussion about it. We are. Go ahead, Dick. Okay. Um, as I had discussed at the previous meeting, the state police will mark um, November 23rd as the 10th anniversary of the death of Sergeant Elson. Um, they were looking to do a ceremony in front of the barracks, and by way of the state police PBA, the uniform members and the officers associated when Jeffrey was working. Uh, right now, it's Major um, Regan. Uh, they were asking if the county would be kind enough to dedicate that piece of road from the barracks to the town of Neversink Line. He died about halfway just above uh, where Airport Road is. I think it's a very fitting thing for the county to do. Um, it is a very sad day if we lose any uh, emergency first responder. And in this particular case, it was right at home there at Liberty. Jeffrey uh, had been with us a number of years. Uh, Matter of fact, the intersection that I recently had my accident, Jeffrey used to come out when my office was at 911. I used to go through the intersection, and it seems like he was always the trooper that was there because he was on the highway task force. And he used to always say to me and pull his sunglasses down, and he'd say, Mr. Supervisor, we got to get this road fixed. All right, so here we are, 10 years after. Committee. Yeah, 10 years in, and we're, we still haven't fixed the road well enough, because obviously I got hammered. Well, you don't know and, how to drive anyway, but well, let's that aside. <laughs> I'll tell everybody. But I think it, it's a great honor, and I think it that is. the legislature, you know, to commend the legislature to support this. And uh, I know next week uh, at your full board meeting, don't be surprised if you see some guys in gray uniforms and purple ties. Uh, Tom. Uh, Mungir, who's president of the State Police PBA, uh, will address you at that time. And also there's some Edelson family members that live here in Monticello and so forth. So I think it's a rightful thing, and I would wholeheartedly support you, and thank you if you pass this. And the big thing for the press, we are not changing the name of the road. The road stays Never Sink Road, Route 55, which is a state touring road. It's owned, maintained by the County of Sullivan, but we're putting that portion of the road in the town of Liberty in his honor. And if you travel around the state, there are other roads where law enforcement or fire um, members have lost their lives, and the local governments at that time do um, make a special memory out of that area. Okay. Okay. So now we'll make a motion to pass the resolution. The I'm sorry, just the vote. I should know this by now. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay. Now, on your agendas, you'll see that there's a discussion for grant spreadsheets. And rather than have a separate discussion on that, I'd like to interweave it with the uh, reports because they're pertinent to that. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone, including Art Hussey. I don't, I know he's okay. got, oh, yeah. thank you for taking time to come here mm -hmm. for this. And I'm going to very briefly explain the reason why this is so important. Uh, my understanding is that, the, that we, a few years back when there was a new software system that was incorporated into uh, the county, the designation of what was fe federal and state funding was no longer separate. It was kind of interwoven in with the rest of the budgets. And last year, I think you had mentioned that the amount at that time that it was coming through the Department of Grants was somewhere in the neighborhood of 13 million, but you couldn't necessarily identify it in the tentative budget or the final budget. And because of the fact that so much of what we do is dependent on grant funding, whether it's a, an automatic allocation, which we all know has been diminishing over time, or competitive grant funding to do fundamental essential work, particularly in public safety, I want to thank everyone 
who uh, submitted their spreadsheets with all of their grants. What this will help us do is to be able to say what portion of the overall budget is dependent on grant funding. And it's also important that all the information does come to ART because if, if you don't get it, then it, it makes an appearance as though there's a gap in the funding when, in but fact, you, you it's already... Following up with the division heads and department heads concerning mm -hmm. getting the current activity and the awards as well. And that, that'll probably be an email that'll come out of OMB direct to the division heads and department heads. So I want to thank everyone who's taken the time to submit the information for these grant uh, spreadsheets. So we have here first, the first update is with Dick and Alex, and um, so however you, you guys have divided it up. Okay, uh, just some of the things I've been working on in our division, obviously I've been working with the county manager on our bud budget proposal for next year, trying to go over all the lines and see where we can cut and or if we have to make any changes, and that seems to be moving along. We've spent an enormous amount of time with grants. I want to thank Art in particular. He's a super guy to work with. Um, sometimes I think I live in his office, he lives in mine. And um, there's an awful lot that comes to my division, quite frankly, with all the monies that are being spent for the radio interoperability program without those grants. I don't know how we would be able to do it. Right now we're at a 70-30 split. It's 2.7 million coming in from grants. And we're uh, in discussions with the Department of Homeland Security whether their eligibility criteria allows us to go for uh, ESD funding, Empire State Development funding, and you know, like that. We're always on the hunt for more money. That's correct. Last week I had to go to New York City for a counterterrorism meeting. Um, of officials. I'm on the JTFF uh, Executive Committee and I sat with Commissioner Hauer, our Homeland Security from New York and uh, what I was very pleased to be able to do is to buttonhole him for 30 minutes and talk about the grants because at this time we need more money for radio interoperability. He has the ability uh, with the next round, round four, Sam, there's hopefully a we'll make here. it in such a way that we will be eligible. Right now round three we're not because there were 25 counties that did not get any revenue during the first two rounds so they want to kind of level the score which is fine but you know we lobby where we can just like all of you do when it's necessary uh, so moving off the grants and we spent a lot of time um, I also went up to Glens Falls and had a meeting of the uh, state um, DWI coordinators it's another hat I wear and we are preparing our 2014 DWI program which will be coming in front of the legislature very shortly um, we're looking to see the progress and the amount of money that we're spending with the various law enforcement agencies I know the sheriff's office has been doing a lot of the uh, DWI sobriety checkpoints and had good results I have to thank the sheriff and under sheriff for, for pushing it and also for the chief uh, Blake there there's a seat right here there's three seats right here you. We don't bite today yet, so if you want to sit with us. <laughs> anyway, i got to thank also the chief for, for the support for the DWI program. Uh, we're going to have another victim impact panel next Tuesday, and I, uh, I'm not happy to report it, but we have 50 to 60 people that are sentenced by courts for, as a result of DWIs. So that is a problem in our community, and we are looking at other alternatives of what we can do. But in the meantime, the law enforcement side of the house has been working and doing a great job. Um, I just came back from Orange County Training Center. Uh, we have a grant for hazmat equipment that we already own, where we and a consortium of Ulster, Orange, Rockland, and ourselves are working to do the yearly checks of the equipment, the calibration, and also adding a couple more meters. We're talking to further try to do a multiple response when necessary, not, not to come for the sake of coming, but by designation. We're going to be doing radiation in Sullivan County. So we have a lot of meters and I've got to get some more training for our guys. In the world of counterterrorism, my attendance at the meeting last week, of course, uh, there's a lot of people who are working, uh, concerned about what goes on in Syria and maybe at the county level some folks would say, well, what's that really got to do with us? It has a lot to do with us because whatever happens over there, what our country does on the national level could affect our county, our communities in many, many ways. Uh, whether there's uh, oil pipelines that are destroyed that are going to drive the cost of gasoline up to ten dollars a gallon I mean I can go on and on if you don't want to hear it all read it in the paper but what sh you should know is that there are a dedicated group of people 
in the law enforcement and in the intelligence world that are trying to keep their fingers in the pie so they know what's hot and what's not. Let me um, ask a silly question, not to interrupt. Yes. The wildfires out west, is there any truth to the rumor that those are done by terrorists? None that I'm aware of. I'm just curious. Yeah. I, some I, of it is lightning, some of it, that well, one very big one was a hunter. Okay, I have not, I've not heard that through the, from the uh, counterterrorism group. Okay. What they are concerned about is that if something happens in Syria, we take some action, well, that there's going to be a pushback, and pushback in our own communities, that there are individuals who will be upset and will take out their vengeance uh, in, uh, with our communities. The second part of the whole thing on the counterterrorism, there's another grouping that's coming into the United Nations for a big meeting here in the near future. We've got the uh, Super Bowl game going to be in Jersey in early February. And all the folks that are looking on the national stuff are also working in the local areas. And again, our area and why I even sit there is because we're a prime location that if somebody wants to experiment with explosives or radiation, we've got hunting clubs, we have summer locations, we have older farms, and they can go there, experiment, get in a car in two hours, they're in the middle of one of the largest populations in the world. So that's what this is about. And again, the, the verbiage that we always use, if you see something, say something. Let someone in law enforcement know. They know who to go to, and they will take care of it so nobody gets themselves in trouble. Um, I want to thank everybody for yesterday for the 9-11 ceremonies. The, those of you that were able to attend, we had one in Highland the night before. There was one in Smallwood yesterday morning, and of course Monticello here last night, as well as in Wurtsboro. And uh, we never want to forget those that were lost, nor the story of how it came about, because that's where our future is. And last but not least, we've been working very hard, uh, German, with the radio interoperability, with the contracts. Uh, we've got to thank Kathy Jones for all her work, for the county manager, and of course, Art, Alex. Um, we've got it all put together, and we'll start reviewing it here shortly, and that's a big, a big piece to the puzzle as we get going. So as for those of you who remember when Alex did that uh, starting from year one, uh, six <coughs> years ago, and, and how far we've progressed since there, since then, we, uh, uh, tell me if I'm stealing your thunder here, Alex, we've got six RFP resolutions coming down the pike, right. and so what we've decided to do, I'll let you <coughs> speak, but we're going to take a vote as to whether we have a recessed uh, s public safety meeting on Tuesday in the afternoon or Thursday morning because it's such a complex project that we want to have a separate meeting just on the resolutions, just on the RFP. So over to you now, Alex. Yeah, you can take it from there. We want to put the team together. We've had RFPs out for construction management, project management, um, site management, um, engineering. Uh, there's also, we had some grant money to, uh, to replace the 911 phone system. So we have an RFP out for that. So we're in the process of reviewing all those, and we'd like to bring them to this board to, to move them this month so we can still take advantage of some of the um, end of the construction season here, and maybe we'll have a, um, you know, a mild winter. We'll see how that goes. But um, you know, it's certainly been, been moving. We're putting the team together, and I think it's looking good to, to move forward. And the important part of that's going to be most of this is out of the, the round one and round two grant funding that we had. So there's if any, very little uh, money to spend on. Um, so on your grant summary chart, which uh, you ju I just got, there's two open grants, and those are or three, the PSAP, the SEIC, GP rounds one and two, and then all of the New York State reimbursement for 911 related expenses, which was somewhere between 38 and 40,000 each year, 2009, 10, 11, and 12. Those are closed. So do we have any reimbursements pending? Is that the 38000 that we just uh, applied? No, nope, that, that program has been discontinued. I think okay. the last, what was the last year on that for 11? Last year, 2012. 12. Um, so the $38,000 allocation was discontinued by the state, that local emergency, um, local enhanced 911 program. Okay. And in place, they uh, they turned it into a, $75 million pot, and they turned it into a competitive grant uh, across the, the state. Okay, so, so it's not as though we're having to find that 38000 from our own county share at this point? Well, we will, yes. Okay. That, that's no longer an allocation from the state. That was turned into a competitive grant. 
So does that mean that in the 2014 budget it's going to be added to your budget? Is that how it's going to shake out? Correct. It won't show as a revenue for 38000 Yeah, the county share would automatically go up, ignoring everything else by 38000 and there's no way to find this from any other place. Well, there are some other cost savings, you know, moving forward and moving on. For example, this phone bid, um, the, the grant that we had gotten, we figured in five years of maintenance with that. So, you know, that'll offset where our maintenance may have been eighty to 100000 a year to be able to cover that, you know, kind of offset it with the, uh, with the maintenance cost in the grant. So, um, you know, that, that was a good from the PSAP grant, which is what we're working on now to get the phone system paid for through the PSAP grant. Okay, so now we're just going to get a show of hands, a consensus for the people who are on the public safety meeting, you know, voting members for a Tuesday afternoon meeting, like at 3 o'clock, I think it was what you, what, what was uh, the time? Preferably Thursday, I believe Dick was I out know, of town. But first we're going to get a show of hands on Tuesday, that would be Tuesday in the afternoon or Thursday in the morning. Okay, those are the two choices. Cause what, are the what are the dates? What are the dates? That would be seventeenth or the nineteenth. Okay, because we have to do this before the executive, and we don't want to put an undue burden on Annie. Who I don't do public safety agenda, so no. I don't but you do the executive on Thursday. Uh, yeah. Well, it doesn't go on executive because I'm full addendum, so full it doesn't addendum. it doesn't affect me. Okay, so Where can I have a, hand, a show of hands? Excuse uh, me. Can yes. I just interrupt? Yes, I'm not can. a voting member, but I do believe that there's caucuses on the 17th at eight regarding the budget. Am I incorrect on that, Josh? That's not correct, is it? So there are, yeah, 8.30 to whenever they conclude, yeah. Okay, we're talking about Tuesday at 3 o'clock or okay, Thursday yeah. at 8 o'clock in the morning, Sorry. not at night. That's okay. We just want to get this all done and dusted before the executive. So Tuesday, show of hands. Either one is fine with me. Okay, Thursday, show of hands. Thursday has it. Thursday, 8 a.m. 8? 8 o'clock. <laughs> oh. oh. 8 o'clock. Oh. 8 o'clock. Stick to it, Gloria. Don't get in now. I said 7.30. It's going to be a long day. 8 o'clock. Chairman Smoker, it's over. How's that? <laughs> Thursday, 8 o'clock. 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 Thursday, Getting on the road. Now they have a five. What do you mean? I live in work girl. Seven. So you walk oh, again. Oh, stop. <laughs> you okay, walk in. I'm walking. I'm riding my bike. Okay, let the public record show. We're going to recess today's public safety meeting for Thursday at 8 a.m. For all voting members, it's open to the public. All uh, media is invited to come and, and any non voting members. Um, I'm sorry, Dick, I overlooked your. If you could just do the quick grant summary, please, I'd appreciate it. Okay, in my side of the house, the, the newest one is the State Homeland Security uh, for 2013. Um, we have a total of $180,000. We just got the contract on August 31st. Um, some of that is LE uh, TPP which is for the sheriff's office. The rest of it is 135000 in my office, which we're putting all towards the radio interoperability program. We have the EMPG 2012, which was for my office to be run. It's normally an allocation, uh, so we did get that from the state. We have the SHSP 2012, did 13, now we're in the 12. We have uh, $99,000 again for generators for the towers. Uh, the sheriff has 33,000 on that one, total of 132,000. The SHSP, and those expire in August uh, 2014. SHSP 2011, that's also going to have $148,000 for communications equipment, some detection equipment for radiation, but primarily it's for pagers for communications for our responders. Uh, sheriff side is 76,000, total of 225,000. That expires in. August 2014 and then last but not least the oldest one that we're trying to finish up with is our SHSP 2010 uh, we have some equipment that we've already purchased for communications the total cost there was 196,000 uh, there was some public health money small amount six thousand five hundred and sixty dollars I know that um, and we did get for the sheriff's office 89,581. so that was a total of three hundred twenty one thousand what I want, and that's good until February in 14, 28th and 14. What I want everybody to notice, we've gone from 321 to 225 to 132 to 180. So we've been kind of like going down. It came up a touch 
and they have no idea where we're going to go from here. And that's coming right out of the commissioner's mouth because the feds are cutting back. And their big thing is they want this money spent down. So we're working very hard to spend it down because obviously if you've got four years ago you were promised money, why haven't you spent it? Our answer is because we're putting the radio project together. We are now buying a lot of other things, and that's now coming together. So that money line will go down very quickly in the very near future. Thanks, Dick. So out of all of this, how many, I just see there's one line that um, is on personnel. That's the only uh, relief we have on that, staff. That's right. That's my salary. That's my office, and uh, they put it towards my salary. Okay. Okay. So um, I just hope that this gives a very brief, quick overview and indication as to how important grant funding is to um, the day-to-day -day function of public safety. In all, in all honesty, Cora, if I didn't have the grant funding, I don't know how my office would exist. Right. Okay, we were very, very heavy dependent on it, and we're trying to put as much of it that we got over to the radio side because that's one of the most important things I can do from my side. And I just want everyone in this room to be aware, yet again, this is another situation where, you know, uh, the funding's dependent on the feds, comes through the state, and uh, again, New York State is one of the donor states where we give more money than we get back. And until we start to change, redress that balance, a uh, county like Sullivan, in the economic straits that we're in, is not going to get the full share that other places get. All right, even though <coughs> New York State's a big donor state. So now I'd like to go uh, to, if you don't mind, I, I know that the DA has a big, um, oh, I'm sorry, Greg. Mine's short and simple. We made it through another summer, no major incidents, no major MCIs, That's and we're just looking forward to a nice, peaceful winter and moving forward to some training initiatives. Thank you. That's the kind of report we like to hear. Um, we know that the DA is involved in a big case, and so I'd like to go now down to, uh, to the probation department. I'd also like to mention that I have invited some guests, uh, Jerry and Randy from DFS, to join us so that you can be hearing this part of the conversation because I've asked Jeff and his staff to do a, a kind of an in-depth look, such as it is in-depth. Um, on the ATI Alternatives to Incarceration Program. Thanks, Jeff. And that was a great handout for everyone who wants the... Uh, yeah. I, the yeah, could yeah, I have that? That shows the numbers. Mr. Grant? No. Do you have the we're, grant, we're, we're, you have the grant sheet also? Um, we'll make copies and, spread, and send those out. I just got these two copies. I mean, there is this microscopic text one which I'm happy to pass on to you. And we'll make copies for everybody who needs is them. It, is this just that's one? That's no, that's, that's the whole kit and shoulder. I, I, I can share that I'll be able to try and do it. No, wait. It's all, that's oh, all it's all one. Oh, right? okay. Uh, oh, that's why I was, okay. Don't send it to me, like I don't want to. As far, could I just ask a question about the grants? Maybe. Absolutely. Um, as far as the Homeland Security grant, is that you're working in collaboration with um, grants administration? 100%. Okay. Yeah, everything that, so, in other words, we get awarded a grant by the state for X amount of dollars. Uh -huh. They tell us how much money we're going to get. Then they give us the parameters of what areas that money can be spent for. That's when I sit with Art and, and, and Vicki, and we make a proposal. Oh, wow. I, I'm sorry, <laughs> that was the way it came. Can you do that? Yeah. 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 That's why Art said he's going to send that. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, so you direct yeah. Art yeah. to yeah. find yeah. the grant, yeah. and you work with grants yeah. to um, secure the funding, and you follow the funding through. You, is that how it works? So who's formula? doing that grant? We receive a notification of a reward in the case of what Dick was referencing allocations. That then triggers us. They send us an application packet. You wouldn't receive that app, that allocation if you didn't put in the app. Okay, so the so application. So we have to actually put in the application working with Dick's office, mm -hmm. get it so all So the together, award submit. notification comes to Dick mm -hmm. or to you, Ford. and then you send it to Art. Art does the work, gets the grant, submitted. Right, and then you approve to accept it. Right. Okay, and then it's my job to make sure that the areas that we said we would spend the money per the state's approval is accomplished. So in other words, if I got, for instance, $200,000 and 175000 is going to be towards the purchasing of generators for the radio towers, 
then it's my responsibility to secure uh, the purchasing of those towers, or I'm sorry, those generators. I work with the county manager, we get the money advanced. As soon as we get the bills, we submit it to the state. Art helps me with that end of it, and then the money comes in and we get our money back is what it And is. so the grant funding itself, the, the, um, the notification of the, the funding goes to you. So you are getting them for Homeland Security projects. That is correct. And a copy goes to Scott. Scott knows every time that we get a, an award from No, but she's talking about, you're talking about I'm, the notice that announces there's a funding yeah, opportunity. I'm just wondering, you know, I'm glad that you're getting the money and that you're able to, you know, bring the cost down here on, at our table. But I'm wondering if there's other opportunities. You probably get opportunities all the time for different initiatives. There is. So. You know, various sources out there that could be explored for different needs, public safety needs, public work needs. That's part of the reason why uh, Art, for so many months now, has put this grants manual together in a checklist and a concept form so that there's a uniform system in which all departments so where go is that? through. Well, it's is your, are all departments on, on this? Because no, I only asked for public safety, Kitty. I did okay, because I, I don't see anything from public works. Yeah, but right. it's, this, is a public safety public safety committee. Committee. this is a public safety committee. I, I thought it was a, a sample document of all grants. I wanted to know the proportion of grant funding. Right off of our activity and award chart for discretionary opportunities that we're made aware of that departments and divisions are pursuing, as well as any notifications we receive for those individuals relative to allocations, legislative member items. We keep a complete chart on that. It's shared with OMB. It's shared with the treasurer's office monthly. We usually try and get it out monthly. Um, so you have a similar thing for any department yes. that is applying for grants. Yes, and you may find that there are some gaps there, and we're in the process of addressing that with the various Those division are the department gaps heads. that I need. Okay. And we're working on getting that done for you. All right. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Do you want this? No, I don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. At any time, if anybody would like to see their chart, they should feel free to give me a call and I'll be happy to share it with you. But it's generally an annual process that we do and reaching out to the individuals to ask them what activity do you have going on, what awards have you secured, et cetera. So, so for example, we're going to have a discussion on ATI. Mm -hmm. So you could research the grant opportunities. We recently just received some updated information from probation on mm -hmm. the ATI, the pre-trial release, and I believe the community service components. That's correct. Right. And I think the resolution was passed in May on that. Yeah. So it would probably behoove the legislature to prioritize some of these programs maybe that we want to improve or expand or reform or... That's part of the reason why there's a funneling mechanism in which this, all the departments in the government center go to art. And that's why it's important that people don't just kind of come in from all different angles but go through this funneling system so that it's uniform throughout the departments and the counties as a whole. And that's why we want to have a tight ship here in public safety because at the end of the day it's about lives saved. Now, if, if you'll allow uh, Jeff and you can introduce the staff members you brought with you. Okay, well, before I start with that, I'd first like to just thank Art for all the work that he does with our grants. Because uh, I look at it and I go, oh God, uh, should have stayed home today. And uh, we do receive a point. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, don't do that. It's, um, you know, we received a substantial amount, uh, over 200,000 uh, reimbursement from the state for funding mm -hmm. for the probation office staff, along with uh, funding that's separate for ATI, Alternative Incarceration uh, Program. Uh, and our department coordinator, uh, senior PO, Connie Martin, is right there in the corner. Uh, and next to her is Angel Handel. She's our uh, pre -trial. Sorry, Angel, could you move your chair out onto the other side? Because we, we can't, and Tanya, we can't see you all the way over here. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs> and they didn't want to be in the spotlight, by the way. So. <laughs> oh, so come, on, come on a little bit closer. Oh, well. Come a little bit closer. Come a little bit closer. We don't. I don't think anybody's. Yeah, yeah. The bus is getting bigger. And um, I'm sorry. I don't want to. I just want to preface what I'm about to say, Jeff. Um, I found out from one of the probation officers when they had gone to a conference uh, that there's. It's a very large, non-uniformed <coughs> police force as such, in that you're making arrests, carrying badges, guns, vests. And probation officers are peace officers. 
Correct. And there's going to be a change in the 207C designation. Is that correct? Coming down from the state? Yeah. So, I, you know, what that designation, I think, makes a big difference in my mind as to, you know, the importance of the function, you know, what it really means to be a probation officer. So uh, I just want to make sure, because I wasn't aware of it, I didn't know how many other legislators weren't aware of it either. Uh, basically talking about those, these two programs, alternative incarceration, of which pretrial release is a uh, subcomponent. Uh, they've been in existence for quite a while, uh, since 1998. And uh, ATI is primarily a uh, community service program, uh, which provides the courts uh, with the means of uh, having an individual uh, pay their debt to society without uh, being incarcerated. And that, of course, uh, relieves some of the burden upon the uh, jail. And the uh, pretrial release program uh, is for individuals who um, haven't been uh, sentenced yet, uh, the pending sentencing. And for whatever reason, they can't make bail. Uh, they are uh, basically interviewed by uh, Angel to uh, ascertain their uh, appropriateness for pretrial release. And um, in, in the little handouts I gave there, I mean, both of these programs essentially pay for themselves and then some. Um, th there is a little bit of misinformation in the uh, handout that I gave in reference to the pretrial release program overview. Uh, the second, second, excuse me, second sentence says, offenders accused of serious or violent offenses are not eligible for a pretrial release program. That's true and it's not true, and I know that sounds like real government speak there, uh, but the, uh, there's a score sheet that Angel goes by and uh, sometimes people aren't eligible but that does not preclude uh, a judge from releasing someone on pretrial. So although it's rare, you can't have somebody that's uh, accused of a, uh, a violent felony, such as maybe, let's say, assault first, or uh, a sex offense, and um, they would be under pretrial release supervision. Uh, don't uh, ordinarily, like I said, the uh, score sheet kind of says you can't do that, but the judge can override that score sheet. So uh, we don't have uh, a whole lot of uh, violent felons uh, or people uh, that are committed to or accused of committing a sex offense on a pretrial release. But the majority <coughs> of the uh, pretrial uh, release uh, offenders are, uh, are felonies. Uh, probably 99% of the, your case was made up of felons, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, during 2012, and I'll start with the pretrial release program first, uh, 97 individuals uh, detained uh, pending further proceedings were released to pretrial. And uh, pretrial and, and ATI allow for something else uh, as well. It allows for a uh, reduced classification level for the jail. Um, I don't know how, how many classification levels does the jail have? Four. Four. Without and ATI, we'd have to have 12. You had 12. And the jail couldn't meet the, that criteria without the uh, ATI program. Um, in a nutshell, it's, uh, the program saved the county about $1.2 million last year. Uh, the calculation I used for that was 70 inmates that were released uh, at the cost per day. And 198, is that a correct uh, amount? Uh, give or take a few bucks? Yeah. Um, and the housing cost, and it was kind of uh, figured out in 90 days. Some people are kept for less than 90 days. Uh, some were kept for more, so I kind of just struck a median there. Um, but I would say that's probably a uh, conservative uh, amount that uh, the program uh, saves the, the county. Uh, there's 12% reimbursement uh, for a probation officer by the state, along with, um, is it 13,000 or 18,000 for, for your program, Angel? No? I believe it's 18,000. Yeah, along with additional 18,000. So the state, uh, covers basically half the cost of a, of a probation officer for that. Uh, we are short-staffed uh, right now, and we have, I just find it here. Angel ran some numbers, and she found that uh, there were 39 males and five females that were um, eligible for interview. Um, during the past year, and uh, we were unable to do that due to uh, lack of staff. And that equates to uh, the days in jail for those eligible for interview was 3,427. Uh, 
you can ask Angel specifically about about those numbers because she ran it. And if there's anything wrong about that, I place all the blame on her. We're we're yeah. here to praise you. Short line right across the, the street. So. <laughs> well, I want to ask a question, sure. if I may. Pre-trial is pre-trial, and yet you're saying the judge allows something. So how do you get a judge allowance when the, when the trial didn't happen yet? I can answer that. Um, judge of the Buddha kind of does his own thing. Um, Don't say anything about Judge Lugo. Don't say anything about Judge Lugo. Say whatever you want. Say whatever you want. He's want. a very big supporter of the pretrial release program. Um, when people go in front of him and they've been indicted or whether or not they've taken a plea, he likes to use the pretrial release program as a condition of their bail. So instead of actually raising the bail and putting them back in jail, he'll put them under supervision, which that means they could have a sort of curfew, drug and alcohol conditions, mental health conditions. Um, whatever he wants to have done while they're out in the community. Now, so in other words, he's trying to keep people out of our jail to save the taxpayers money, correct? That is correct. Okay, just want to clarify. <laughs> <laughs> so he's not the reason why we're building an $80 million jail. <laughs> no, that's the reason why we need more people in the jail release program. I was, say, I was just going to say that yeah. it sounds like if you had more employees, Absolutely. you'd save the taxpayers a lot more dollars because they would, I mean, you that finish the sentence. And I'm sorry, not, not to... Um, so the 44 people that I came up with are sitting in the jail today. This isn't over the year. This is today that I have not had a chance to actually go over an interview because the caseload is so much. Um, I do have a lot of violent felonies that are on my caseload, whether that be gang assault, um, burglary seconds, whatever it might be, that need a little bit more um, supervision or more conditions that they have to adhere to in order for them to be out in the community. So yeah, we do need more people. So when you say you need more people, what, give me an example, what would you need to make, save us some money? One person, a half a person, somebody that's, yeah, what, person. I mean. I mean, that, that's something we'd have to look at. Well, you know, the thing is, we'll talk about the budget, and here's another, we'll here's, another we'll here's, another right. here's another issue, is we are now, thank you, Hal, for being here again. You know, we're transporting you know, 35 or 42 people outside the county again because our jail is overcrowded. So and it costs us a lot of money at the end of the year. So I'm just saying, now that we're talking about the budget, maybe we could you could have a discussion during the, our budget uh, Well, process. that's one of the reasons why, actually, I asked uh, Randy and Jerry to be with us here today. My understanding, and I, and I don't want to cross too many, uh, this is an intersection between public mm -hmm. safety in DFS, so I want to keep what needs to be in DFS and DFS, but mm -hmm. I think it's helpful when you're at, at, you know, to hear what goes on in our committee meetings. Um, Randy, my understanding, and correct me, Jeff and Randy, if I'm wrong about this, but my understanding is right now it's between 17 and 21 percent that the state reimburses, but if it was coming through DFS, it could go up as, as high as 75 percent. Is that correct? Jeff and I had a uh a meeting last week and then Jeff has been meeting with uh, DFS legal and Barbara McKinney the services director to look at uh, our pins diversion or <coughs> our pins program person in need of supervision and those are children who are incorrigible ungovernable etc uh, right now DFS is the designated lead agency for Sullivan County, I, I think at some point in the past, probation was the designated lead agency. Uh, there are funds that the county receives, and are I don't know if they're reported in your your grant process or not. I think there are several DFS grants or allocations, and I think at some point in the past there was a decision not to report those to the grants process. But that that's a, an aside issue. But um, there, there is a there's a population of youth, at-risk youth, who are involved with both probation and DFS and community services, and and I think through coordinating efforts between community services, DFS, and, and probation officers, we can look at a, a memorandum of agreement or understanding between DFS and probation and look at some chargeback 
for probation officers um, time and working in cases where there's you know, joint activity. And you do currently have a state police officer on, on the premises at that, DFS? That's with um, a different unit. In our, in our child protective, uh -huh. where we get that's child protective true. investigations right. where there are a crime, allegedly a crime committed toward a child. And, and there is a state police um, BCI investigator assigned who is located within DFS who we work in conjunction with on, on cases with um, child sexual abuse allegations, serious physical abuse allocation, uh, allegations, where again a crime may have been committed against a child. But, so yes, the state police does assign someone to our agency. Because I think that the, the issue that happens whenever, and I, and I know this is a, something that every department deals with differently, if you're getting a certain percentage paid for by a certain department, you may have a time period where that person is working 100% on a particular issue and you know, how do you know that it's going to wash out? So the, the thing that we have to be very careful about in laying out any plan is that the bodies are attributed to being in the ATI program through probation, but then 100 or 110% of their time is you know, somewhere else, so then there's a net loss of what you thought you were going to be getting extra people, but the amount of added work well, doesn't... If I can interrupt you for yeah. a second, I don't think uh, the chargeback that uh, Randy and I were talking about is applicable uh, to the ATI program. Uh, oh, so it, I was under the yeah, well, wrong that's impression. Yeah, well, you. Yeah, but we originally thought possibly it could happen, but uh, investigating it, it, it really isn't something that's feasible. It's really more applicable to uh, adding an officer for um, basically juvenile delinquent uh, pins uh, kids. But you're not uh, doing that now anyway. We only have one uh, officer dedicated to juveniles, whereas we had uh, three previously. So uh, in my discussions with Randy, I, he's concerned about uh, individuals that go through the pins process and wind up in residential, uh, which is an astronomical uh, sum to a place. So somebody. why did the ATA I think didn't? Just let me know why that didn't pan out. It, it's really, I don't see where, uh, it, it really has to be very specific that uh, we're doing a, a DFS function essentially. Uh, and that would be monitoring individuals or juveniles that are uh, brought for a, a pins uh, through DFS. Mm -hmm. uh, you really don't have that avenue that I can see, uh, and right. I know Randy was going to look into it, I don't know what the outcome of that was, but I, I couldn't see anything uh, okay. for the ATI program. Well, that's why we take the time to look into these things. I, I think what would help then is to say, for every one ATI officer, you would then save approximately, then you have the, the minimum range and the maximum range. And that way we can look at, you know, the offset to the, the, the jail cost. Yeah, the other consideration you have to have, I mean, the jail and, and how it could speak more of this than I can, has some fixed costs. I mean, we can right. reduce that jail population to zero through ATI, but you, you still have, you know, uh, X amount of uh, deputies uh, to supervise the inmates. Well, it's the non-budgeted costs that are starting to get everybody a little bit nervous because mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with the fixed costs, right? Correct. You're talking about the four outs. Well, yeah, I see with uh, what I get from the state that uh, well, the last month they have here, July, uh, but all of a sudden you have that significant amount of individuals being boarded out where you didn't have that before. And you have to ask yourself, uh, is this that an aberration or is that uh, you know harbinger of things that come? So. Well, you just gave us yeah. some explanation yeah. for it. I mean, and I just think that this committee would, should serious. I mean, we're in a crisis, folks, whether we want to admit it or not. Now that we're boarding out all these prisoners, we have a crisis. And it's going to be, even when we decide to build the jail, it's going to be three to five years before it's completed. But in the meantime, if some of these, I mean, this is your job. You know, you do, if you could save us, if you need another part-time or full-time person, and you're going to save us thousands of dollars in transportation for, I mean, that's huge to me. So, I mean, now that we're talking about the budget, I would really appreciate you putting a spreadsheet together for us and show us where the, you know, where the savings would be. There's no question that you'd save in the uh, cost of boarding out individuals because you reduce the exactly. population well, of those. Yeah. 
Well, also, we put in all that time for the video conferencing program to see, and we don't have any hard numbers back yet. Uh, yeah. Cindy, then Ira, because she had her hand up first. Um, yeah, if it's, you know, the, these are the two current programs. I was just wondering, what's the role of the local nonprofits that you had mentioned at, at the bottom, you know, the benefits to the local <coughs> nonprofit groups? Okay, uh, for example, uh, I know for, uh, for cash, uh, we're having a uh, individual, uh, they're, they're making new signs. I guess the signs of uh, the cash office in Liberty are dilapidated. Uh, I haven't seen them, but I guess uh, it's, they're being ugh, professionally done. Um, probably save them, you know, like a thousand bucks, something like that. Okay. So, so that's just like one example. So if uh, we're looking at, you know, it looks like according to this information, mm -hmm. approximately two million dollars in county savings instead of boarding out approximately 120 inmates. Mm -hmm. So in order to, and you know, Hal would probably know. Um, that 120, are there more than 120 that you need staff to, um, you know, pass through your alternative programs? I mean, right now we're incapable of adding anything, any, any individuals that are 120 is like two staff yeah, people like if there are 55. You, you want to keep, uh, So if, if you were to get two more staff people, you could double those numbers? Double those numbers, that's correct, yes. Mm -hmm. Because each probation officer has somewhere so in the range of 50 up. Uh, for 120, so if you had 240, you could save you double that. The for the price of two yeah. staff? Yeah. Basically, like I said, the, the numbers indicate the... So the did you have up. that staff before? We did. Uh, what happened uh, approximately four years ago, we had the uh, ATI coordinator leave, and... Um, that position was not filled, so we had a probation officer, which is Tanya, uh, as a hybrid position doing uh, two functions. Um, a county manager, approximately three years ago, when the pretrial release person left, um, they didn't fill that position, so we had uh, an officer take over that function. So essentially, it consolidated four positions down to two positions. Uh, which I understand, you know, it wants to save money. So in the past, but the savings were that tremendous for? Yeah, they were that tremendous. That, that, well, the, as long as you're outboarding, yeah, you'll have as to long, As long as you're outboarding. I mean, it's, yeah. it's uh, If you're not so outboarding you anyone, yes, you'll release people quicker, but you're not so going to save. So what's the ratio I mean, of them staying in jail to boarding out that you've seen? Or boarding out. I know. There's, there's uh, no such thing. You weren't boarding out? Issue. Yeah. What, well, well, they didn't have to because they had this, these other programs. And that's so. why I thought consolidate and yeah, my thought on it was that well this might be a temporary law and maybe it will start going up but uh, right. th that's what was done uh, uh, question, how wait many uh, Ira do was next Kitty Ira had his hand what's up the first. besides the transportation next. course how what's the cost uh, for boarding out I know it's a range with Orange County being higher what yeah, it's 85 to 125 that's the range didn't we have this discussion earlier? Yeah, they weren't, but we did. This, yeah. the jail the people weren't here, so I'm going to send more questions for them later anyway. So this sorry, is called the safety. I'm sorry. What? I want to know what it costs for that. Okay. 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 So I, I wanted to know monthly how many people do we board out, and has it been on a rise? It is definitely on the increase, but it fluctuates every month. Right now, you're boarding out 38. What did we board last month? 40, was it 42 40, last month? Yeah, 40, so we're 47, boarding on a regular basis yeah. around 40 people? Yeah. Or is that just in the summer months? 30 to 40. Well, it's been running since, I think we started this in April. In April, the numbers started going up. In April, it had six, and then it's the 28th in, uh, in July. And I don't have the last sheet with me, but it was 40. Uh, can so. Josh just pitch in for a second here? It was a two year, three year. I, yeah. I mean, we've had these conversations during the budget meeting and stuff. And, I mean, I didn't know it was going to come before the tenant budget, but in essence, if, if today you have 44 people currently that probation can't serve under this program, you have almost that many being outboarded. So in theory, if a position or part-time, whatever, could service those people and get them out, you wouldn't be outboarded. That's what I think That's they're trying to get at. Right. Say that again. So you wouldn't say You almost have one for one. They can't get to 44 people to interview to be able to see if they can get them out on pre-trial or ATI, whatever the program so is. We have so we have and then you have almost have that same amount being outboarded currently. So in theory, I mean, you may have some classification issues, but just assume, uh, ignore the yeah, classification. You could almost reduce that outboard to zero with assuming a body or position could service 44 
these this 44 pop population. Assuming they're eligible. Well, Assuming they're eligible. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's like, assumptions in there, but. Yeah. But it still justifies the position, wouldn't you say, Hal? Huh? Oh, I, I, I would say. Absolutely. You know, I'm not going to hear anything. I can borrow that anymore. Well, it's got to be done. Moving right along. Thank you. Let's all focus back on the jail. Does anybody have any more questions about this ATI and uh, free trial release? Program. Really quickly, Jeff, because you're the expert here. As far as ATI, have you, and I know that uh, the video conferencing, and, and are there other options of programs that other counties use that Sullivan hasn't explored? Basically, uh, Angel, do 30 counties have a. And it's program? 30 plus counties actually have pretrial release programs. Um, other counties also have what's called a uh, TAC, is it um, more of a community based? where they have actually have workforce come in um, and they also have um, other, uh, I'm sorry, other uh, rules of supervision that they have to abide by. Ours is, we try to keep it at a minimum because that's what primarily pretrial is supposed to be. And I'd just like to interject that uh, this is probably the best working model because most other counties are using something very similar to uh, the model we have. I mean, so there's a certain framework you have to work in with, with you know, the So state would an expanded role of workforce development help as well? Oh, of course. I think it would also help. I mean, but you're working with them now? We're currently yeah, working, yeah. working with them. to set that up. Yeah. Right. Oh, you yes. haven't had it before? No. Oh, so you're setting it up now. Yes. It's in the work, hopefully. Will, will you be able to do it without the grant, or it's dependent on the grant before you can do it? Honestly, we've been so overloaded, it's never even been looked at prior to now. And can you just give me a, a sense of how it works? Because I don't get that from how it, <coughs> what the operation of it is. Sure. Um, a pre, uh, actual pretrial release case, there's two separate areas, um, what I like to divide the caseload into. One is a, is a true pretrial release case where I have to go to the jail and I do a screening. And it determines whether they're even eligible for an interview. So what that basis is on is if they live in the community, um, if they have any holds at the jail for other issues, if they're currently on any type of community-based supervision, whether that be parole or probation, and whether or not they have bail. So based on those four criteria, I then go to the jail and I do the interview. All the information that's um, provided at the interview has to then be verified. If it all turns out well, the information is turned over to the judge and the judge makes the final determination as to whether or not he's gonna, come, he's gonna go along with the recommendation. Other judges, um, Judge Laguda, Judge McGuire, and a few handpicked others, um, will release them, Judge Finn included, will just release them to pretrial. Here you go, supervise them. I don't care whether or not they would make the points or not. This is your job, this is what you're gonna do. And your caseload is some, what, how, what's the, I know the average is not the right number, but more or less, how, what's your caseload? Um, the winter months is usually higher. So it's usually around 60 area. Right now it's a little bit of a low 60. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just, it varies. I mean, right now it's down a little bit. However, it's more violent felonies that happen beyond the caseload. So it takes up more time. Right. Uh, I would also like to point out that uh, besides uh, that function, uh, Angel does have, uh, she's our trans transfer designee for individuals that are sentenced in this county but live uh, elsewhere. Um, so. Once again, we get to staffing issues that uh, you know, there's a, a whole lot on our plate. Um, and so they're here, let me just make sure I'm clear on this, because they may live elsewhere, but they committed the crime in Sullivan County. Is that how it's worked? W why well, they sure, would? Just because you know, the proximity of uh, Orange, Ulster, and somebody in, uh, lives in Middletown, comes over to a concert, or has relatives, or whatever, and is out to you know, go on to Delaware and Calicoon. Uh, they do a little something, they get in trouble, uh, they're sentenced here, uh, but their primary residence uh, could be in uh, Middletown, could be in Brooklyn, uh, especially during the summer. We have a, a lot of individuals that uh, their uh, residents, they might have a southern residence here, but uh, primarily they live uh, in New York City. Or so primarily or would you say that after the program, you do the you do a transfer, is that what, what you call no, it? She doesn't and they go no, back this, to this, the residence? She, she has additional responsibilities besides right. doing the pretrial release. So 
Uh, you can say, oh, wow, you only have 40 people this time, you only have 60 people now. It's not a lot of people, but she has a lot of other uh, stuff to do as well. Uh, but do you have a mechanism where they return to their prior residence? Sure. The state has that uh, process that uh, mm -hmm. if you sense probation, uh, your entire probation, let's say you live in Nassau County, is now Nassau County. Uh, Probation department. So once they would fulfill their judge, you know, the court ordered program mm -hmm. and they finish, then yeah. they go back to. Then they go back, yeah. So we follow through on whether it's that they go back? Yeah, or oh, absolutely. Because that it all becomes our headache if they don't go back because they have to submit a violation to the court and, uh, you know, possibly they're incarcerated uh, again in Sullivan County. But uh, there's no set. I mean, it's, you know, it, each person's different and, and their circumstances. Um, so you know, the, you, as far as the coordinator of the ATI, you're both the coordinator and the, I mean, is there a coordinator for ATI or that? Okay, so you're both doing cases, right? Correct. Okay, so what would help us, Jeff, is if you go back to that org chart that we worked on in terms of the openings and stuff like okay. that, and just note the caseload per staff, per probation officer. And it's only going to be a snapshot of what we have. We realize that it goes up and down, but that will give us a sense of, you know, how the distribution of these caseloads are done throughout the department. Okay. So That's just so I'm clear, the recommendation here is to have that staff person in probation to work with to ATI. That's correct, yes. Mm -hmm. But we have a little bit more homework to do before we can get to that point. What's the homework? The homework is getting the case numbers from all over the, the department where the holes are and look at, you know, w what the true numbers are. Are we just going for one person? Are we looking for... But you know that. You know that you need a staff person. There's absolutely you know no question. That so you, need, you know the, the job and duties that yeah. that person would do. So we could start with that, correct? Absolutely. And then we can figure out the funding. Like the, what Brandy was talking about, the pins potentially be money being there to fund the probation officer could then okay. potentially be utilized to re u utilize that additional revenue to create potentially another PO potentially. That's what like, we're kind of exploring. All right. So thank you very much. We really, pre we weren't that bad, were we? Coming upstairs? <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for all the work you're doing. We really appreciate it. Okay, there, our last report is with the Sheriff's Office. <laughs> You're the last man standing. Go ahead. You're under the bus. You're up. <laughs> right. This past Tuesday, we, uh, in conjunction with the Division of Criminal Justice Services and the New York State Humane Association, we held an animal cruelty workshop at the Emergency Training Center in uh, Bethel. Is it Bethel, Swan Lake, or White Lake? Official title of Swan Lake, New York. Okay. Old White Lake Turnpike, Swan Lake, New York. So uh, anyway, one two seven eight what? Want to thank uh, three. You're right. Dick Martinkovic and John Household for making the premises available. We had 45 law enforcement officers from around the state, some as far away as Niagara Falls, mm. came to this thing. Oh, yeah. Where'd they stay? Wherever. <laughs> and they better have. You know, they wouldn't have paid their business. They wouldn't have paid it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we had some people from the Queen's Gate. Room <laughs> 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 tax. Still can't get it on that. <laughs> anyway, uh, great seminar. You know, it, it, it's interesting how a lot of the serial killers started out as animal abusers. We talked about that. Uh, I'll give you a window over there. Uh, we had three deputies start the academy Monday, the 9th, down in Orange County. It's at the uh, Orange County Chief of Police Academy at Stewart Airport. When was the last time you had that? The last uh, deputy graduated at the end of August. There was one deputy, Brian Kelton. He started in January, so it's a six month. They'll be getting out in January. We also have four new deputies starting in the jail Monday the 16th. Happy to report that the water was restored in the patrol. <laughs> DPW, they dug a hole out Spool front. That line was dry. They drove a hole in the back. That line, they finally uh, tapped in through the mods. They did a great job. They also went out of county to find the right side of the pipe, didn't they? Well, that, that was a story. Uh, we had a pipe break a couple of years ago on Memorial Day, and uh, they, they said they couldn't fix it till Tuesday. And we said, well, the inmates will call the health department. Yep. Shut us down. So they <laughs> actually went to Pike County on a Saturday and got the pipe. 
this past uh, Saturday? No, no, this no. is a couple years ago. Oh, oh, oh. That was as a result of the tour. So. Story for that. Also, as you probably read in the paper, we uh, recently prevailed in the lawsuit. I'm not going to steal Sam's thunder and a brief you on it, but I just want to yeah. say uh, I've been in this business 30 years. Federal court is a complete different animal than state court. Things can go very wrong in a hurry. And there's a lot of outside counsel that you could hire, and all they want to do is settle. And many times, just settling a case, especially when you're not wrong, sends the wrong message, and then people pile on because they think you're an easy mark. So I want to thank uh, Sam for his efforts. Uh, you really need to know your way around federal court <laughs> to prevail. And uh, again, it's a whole different ballgame. The judges have no tolerance for uh, mistakes or excess. They want to get to the facts and get it done. So uh, again, Sam will brief you on that. Did a super job. Thank yeah. you. Uh, do you have a completed grants chart? Uh, I believe we provided that. I, I guess it wasn't when passed on to you. We had it ready the last oh, session okay. and you were sick. And I was sick. Okay, great. So here's several copies. Thank you. Do you want to go over it real quick? Yeah, sure. And we'll pass it around. Oh we have three uh, L -E -T -P -P L -E -T -P -P grant grants so. from 11, 12, yeah. and 13. I, yeah, I already Those were not shared. Yeah, I already have uh, We have the uh, STEP grant, which is the Selective Traffic Enforcement Program, which comes through the Governor's Office of Highway Safety. Uh, the STOP DWI grant, which is administered by Dick Martinovic's office. Uh, and of course, we have the National Park Service grant to control the river corridor during the summer. When does that end on September 2nd, it says? That, that's done for yes, this year? Yes, that's all done. And uh, it used to be like a uh, twenty-six dollars or $27,000 grant. It keeps getting impaired back. Uh, so what we do is we just, we have less uh, days of patrol out there. We just, you know, work accordingly with whatever is provided. Thanks. Um, I also want to just mention we had a very good uh, showing for people that came to the first Stepping Up to Safety. The next one is next Wednesday. I'll pass this around. Anybody? Uh, so what we had was uh, one of the road patrol. We had, is, he's a lieutenant or a sergeant, Louie? He's a sergeant, but you can promote him. No, <laughs> <laughs> not my job. Um, to, he did a basic um, PowerPoint presentation. Out of the 35 people that were there, eight signed up to start a neighborhood watch right. program. So next Wednesday, it's still open to the public, and I think it's really important that um, you know you put spread the word out through all of your different channels. Um, and Jason Edwards, who's from the uh, Fallsburg Police Department. I spoke to him yesterday. He's been working with, I think it's in Foxcroft Village, a particular neighborhood watch. And uh, he said he's committed to the program. Uh, part of the issue that I saw happening at that first meeting, and I think that this is going a long way to, to working, you know, resolving that, is that people don't know who their local enforcement agencies are. They're confused about the difference between the state police, the sheriff's department, the, and uh, what Jason said yesterday, which I think is a really important issue, is that once you know who your law enforcement officials are and you can build a, a relationship with them, then that goes a long way toward preventing uh, burglaries and so on in the neighborhood. So I'd like the newspapers, the media, the outlets to really, uh, you know, put some effort into publicizing this. And we're going to have the first section of the meeting is for the. It's just a brief catch up on what went in the what went on in the first meeting, so nobody's left behind. And then the second part of the meeting are for those groups that have started their neighborhood watches to talk about the ups and downs and how it's worked out for them. So I encourage everyone to support this initiative. Thank you, Cindy. Or were there any plans to do it on the other end of the county? Yeah, it's going we to will go where we're asked. Has anyone asked you? Nope. Okay. So you sent these notices out to the town boards over there? I asked yes. them to send them They were to sent all out to supervisors and town clerks. Okay, it's good to and know because when we attend town board meetings, we can ask them to request. Yep. 
Okay. We will go where we're asked. And I also asked Dick or Alex to send them out to all the firehouses. People do feel more comfortable going to a firehouse than they do necessarily to the government center, especially if it's a drive at night or whatever. So, um, you know, we, it's not a one-shot deal. We're in it for the, the long haul. And um, I'm really very, uh, what did you think, Ira, this response at the first meeting? You were great. there? Good, that's all I need to hear. <laughs> all right, so. Um, Captain, I have a quick question for Eva Hallowell. Um, I noticed when I took the tour, there was a couple young men, young men, they were in class over at the jail. Are those 16 or 17, 18 year olds in the same bunkers as the adults, or you have a separate? They're locked in a separate location. They are, because they're not with the other guy, right? That's part of the classification. Okay, and you have, is it one, just one bunker for the 18 and under, or? I, it, I, I don't notice It flexes all the time. Uh, okay. Right now, I think we've got uh, half a dozen minors, um, but there was times that we had 20, 25 minors. So we have to keep moving that location as we need but to expand it. But they're not put in with the, other, with the adults, separate from the other. Yeah, that's so part of the classification. Okay, that's, so. okay. All right, I think uh, we need to public adjourn this meeting. Uh, public comment. Thank you, Annie. Do you have five minutes? All right, a motion. Ten, to nine, ten. Ten. Okay. Uh, goes back to where our wares are night, our, our, our surcharge that everybody gets. That to me bothers me. It always bothers me. It should have been coming back to every home That's county. Right. And this bit of giving, have a CFAs or whatever, giving it out, and taking my money to give it someplace else and vice versa, does not help us locally. And we should not have been paying so much money out of our taxes to keep our 911 center open for year to year. We should be coming back on that 911 money. I, I know it's an issue with NYSEC, but we really got to get the word out there and put pressure on. And this is just a little side, uh, Dick. Mm -hmm. You go check my fish for radiation uh, if I get that I get from the North Atlantic. Yeah. If Pacific. necessary, can you ask me? I got the tool to do it. <laughs> we can do it in the mouth or we can do it on the outside. Any more public yeah. comment? Okay. Our age, it doesn't matter. Mrs. Labuda moves to recess yes. to 8 a.m. Thursday, Thursday morning. Second by Iris Steindart. Thank you all very much. We really appreciate all the hard work you're doing every day. Thank you. Thank you. 8 a.m.